mobile device applications will have to integrate with the physical and logical resources of the device. For example, they must be able to make phone calls, send messages through chat or email programs installed, access and use the address book, use the camera, and GPS together with map applications, as well as interact with Facebook and Twitter. Some of these features were automatically implemented through semantic domains, such as, for example, the phone semantic domain for the speaker phone attribute. If we open the speaker's details and tap on the phone field, the application installed on the device is open to make the phone call. On the other hand, if we tap on the email field, of email semantic domain, the application installed on the device is opened to write and send an email to the corresponding speaker. Lastly, if we select the address field and tap on the address, the maps installed on the device are opened, showing the address on the map. In addition, with only the image data type for an attribute, when we edit this information, the detail offers the corresponding control to take a picture using the device camera. The camera can also be used to scan QR codes or barcodes. For example, for this application developed for a supermarket chain, we can scan the barcode of a product we have at home, of which we've run out, and we can search for it in the application and view its current price or add it to the shopping cart. To do so, we have two options. Using an attribute or variable of character or varchar type, changing its control type to SD scanner, when the control is an input control, the scan button will be automatically added. Pressing this button will open the barcode reader installed on the device. The other option will be to program an event, which may be a tap on the variable, where we use the scan barcode method of an API provided by Genexus to this end. The API is like an external object that offers properties, methods, and events to abstract its implementation and provide functionalities. Here, we would invoke a method that will run the barcode reader installed on the device, which in turn will use the camera. The value read will be returned by the method. Next, we will be able to invoke a panel for smart devices that shows all the information about this product. In some cases, the APIs will need to work with structured data types that come predefined in Genexus with them. As an example, there's a collection SDT and a scan in loop method to read a series of barcodes, one after the other, to process them later. In sum, Genexus will give us a set of APIs to add various features to the mobile application. In particular, to allow for the integration with other applications and device features. All of the APIs, SDTs, procedures, and data providers required by them are in the Smart Devices API folder. Some offer interoperability with messaging applications that allow the sending of messages, scanning barcodes, running video or audio files, sending emails, SMS, showing messages to the user, or asking for confirmation, among other things. For example, if we open a session's details, we can see that we can share some of its information. Note that we're offered to do it with the messaging programs installed on the device. How was this implemented? If we open the detail of work with session, and we look for the event code corresponding to the share button in the application bar, we can see that the interop API is used with its send message method. Another API that had previously appeared was SD actions. Among other things, it allows abstracting the login, return, refresh, save, and cancel functionality. The latter are methods that we had already seen in the events automatically implemented by the work with pattern at the detail level. For example, if we open the detail, the speaker's general section, we can see the update and delete methods, 
for the view mode. For the edit mode, we have save and cancel. If we open their programming, we see that they use the API we mentioned before. This save event corresponds to when we're editing a speaker's details, and we want to save this information in the database. The save method of this API encapsulates the invocation to the corresponding business component. Next, it returns to the caller. This return corresponds to the API's return method. Even if the API's name hasn't been set as a prefix, some methods of this API and the interop API, such as message or confirm, accept leaving out the API's name due to the frequency with which they are used. Let's see a session's details again. We can also schedule it in our device calendar. Here we see the session's title or name, the room where it'll take place, and the date. How do we achieve this integration? Through the calendar API, which offers the schedule method to which we have to send the parameters displayed here. If we open the session's detail, we see the corresponding button, we open the event's code, and we're effectively calling the calendar API with a schedule method, passing it this information, session name, session initial date, final date, initial time, end time, and the room name. Now, suppose that from the speakers list, after adding a new speaker to the database, we want to also have it added as a contact in the contact book of the device. To do so, after invoking the detail in insert mode, we must invoke the address book API. Method, add contact, and we must send it these parameters, and in this order. These parameters will correspond to details of the speaker added by the user in this panel. How do we retrieve this data to send it as a parameter to this method? Remember that insert offered two options. The first option was to not send any parameters, and the second was to send a single parameter of the data type, the business component associated with the level in which the insertion is to be made. This business component allows us to start values on the screen being invoked. Also, when the insertion is completed, it returns loaded with all the inserted values. This is how we will be able to retrieve this data to send it to the add contact method. And for this reason, we will create a speaker variable. By default, since it has the same name as the business component, it will be started with this data type and also this variable, which is the one that we will use, to add these parameters in the add contact method. The first one, first name, will correspond to speaker, period, speaker, name. The second one, last name, will correspond to speaker, period, speaker, surname. We're told that the third one is the email address, speaker, period, speaker, email, and next, the phone number, the one after that is company name, and since we don't have this data, we will send the empty chain because we must send the parameter even if we don't have it. The photo will be speaker, period, speaker image. The message, empty chain. We try to save, and we're warned that the composite block is missing. We will talk about this command in another video, but we already know that every time we have two invocations within the same event, we must encapsulate them within that command. If we save now, we won't run into any issues. Let's press F5 and try it. We add a new speaker, 
we select an image from our image gallery and we leave the resume empty. We add a country, Uruguay, a phone, address, email, and we save. As we can see, the data was added to the database. The address book is opened to create the new contact with the corresponding details. And we can see that a new speaker has been added. In our application, we've added a panel that shows the latest tweets of the hashtag defined in a preferences transaction of our event in the attribute event preferences Twitter hashtag. From this panel, we will be able to enter a new tweet with this hashtag defined. Therefore, note that we're integrating with a Twitter application installed on the device. How was this implemented? Let's open Genexus. We can see the transaction where we have to enter this data. We do so using a data provider where we set Genexus as hashtag. But here, it will be the hashtag corresponding to the event that is taking place. And we will have to visit this Twitter website for developers to request a key and a token to communicate with the application. Here, we're using one from Genexus. Next, we go to the panel that implements all this that we've defined with a grid based on a variable tweets display of collection type. This variable will have to be loaded with the last 30 tweets of this hashtag. This is done in the refresh event where we have to communicate with this host api twitter.com to obtain the token. Then, with the corresponding hashtag that was obtained in the start event, taking it from the record of the corresponding table, and here we see that it was reformatted in this way. So we're saying, for the token, the hashtag and the number of tweets that we want to retrieve, we use this tweets variable. The variable is run through here which loads the collection variable that will be displayed in the grid. Next, we have the button that allows the user to enter a tweet. Note that here we're using the API Twitter API tweet method. This API offers two tweet methods. In one of them, we only send the message to retweet and in the other, we send the text and the image. On the other hand, we have the follow method. There are some more APIs. For example, one that allows us to know if there's a connection with the server at a given moment, and the connection type. Another one is to obtain information about the device running the application, its ID, operating system, version, language, also, another API that allows defining global variables for the device. An API to integrate with Facebook, and another frequently used to work with geolocation. We've already used the geolocation semantic domain when we wanted to show restaurants, not as a standard list, but as dots on a map. To do so, we only had to change the control type of the grid to SD maps. In our application, we've implemented the list of restaurants corresponding to the work with node, where the grid has the default control type. On the other hand, users have the possibility to indicate the time they have available for lunch. And we show them the restaurants that commit to offer the service within the time assigned. This is a panel 
whose layout is very similar to the work with list with the difference of this attribute here. And the grid data that will be displayed as dots on a map because we have the restaurant geolocation attribute. We may only want to show the user the restaurants located within a certain distance from the device's current location. This is where the geolocation API can play a role. It offers methods, for example, to obtain the current geolocation for which it needs the device's GPS, track the route of the device through time, end the tracking, obtain its latitude from a geolocation or its longitude, as well as the distance between two points. Also, we could obtain the address from a geolocation or vice versa, configure proximity alerts or receive them, and so on. Therefore, to show only the restaurants located within, let's say, 400 meters from our device, we have to use the getDistance and the getMyLocation methods in the grid when filtering the data to show. This is exactly what an application does to obtain the ATMs nearest to our location. Another frequently used feature is push notifications, which allow the sending of notifications from the web server to the various devices that have our mobile application installed, even when it's not running. In this way, the user will receive the notification sent by the server and will be able to perform the corresponding action. The basic idea is that when the user installs the application on the device and runs it, it's registered in a table on the server. In this way, the server stores the device IDs in order to send them notifications. However, these notifications are actually sent by a provider that varies with the technology used. Apple's is called Apple Push Notification Service. Google's is Google Cloud Messaging. Blackberry's is Blackberry Pushing Service and that of Windows is called Windows Push Notification Service. What we have to do is go to each one of these services to create a project and obtain the necessary credentials. Next, we open the main object of our mobile application and enable notifications. We do this by entering the credentials obtained in the corresponding properties. Then, we must implement the device's registration. To do so, there's a predefined procedure with that name. We can create a new one and place it here, or use the predefined one. Creating a transaction with these attributes to register the devices in the system. This procedure will be invoked every time the application is run on the device. From the object that we need to start push notifications, we create a variable of the collection SDT type, which is included with the API notifications. SDT called remote notification, and we load it through the API's add method, with the notifications to be sent to each registered device. After loading this collection variable, we send the notifications using the send method. This method will encapsulate the invocation to the notification services of each technology. You can read more about push notifications in our wiki. So, in this video, we've introduced just a few of the APIs offered by Genexus, and there are even more of them every day. For more information about the other APIs or the APIs mentioned here, please visit our wiki.